with the steadiness of a longleaf pine. My grandmother shows me how to weather a storm. First, a good coat, then a good harvest. My grandmother repaired a pair of nylons with the same care she needed the soil, coaxing new life from rich Mississippi clay. Red nailed and gold ring, she showed me how a good stitch can give a garment a second life. Here I am waiting for the thread that pulls all of this together so we can begin anew. It is 1952 in Bethune. My grandmother is cleaning out her closet, all 510 of her dreams consolidated in a small room populated by sturdy cloth and mothballs. She is fleeing the South, spilling seeds from her purse, eager to plant possibilities elsewhere. It is 1967 in Detroit, and the seam has been ripped yet again. What was once declared whole by industry and progress unearthed a broken promise. New freeways gutted the land as police raided our harvest. Terror spilled over into the streets, the North's contract dividing the saved and the damned. Is a tear a portal? Can a wound be a door to another world? My auntie stitched up polluted soil and the cuts running scarlet above my uncle's eyes. When has asphalt ever stopped the garden from growing? It is 1990 in Denver and the flight has never left my mother's blood. Reconstruction was sewn in the lapel of her garments through the breastbone of the Rockies that had been shattered years before, the Colorado River soon to be overburdened by our expansive thirst, everything built for obsolescence, all history bound to the landfill's abyss. Today, I am wading through cheaply made ephemera, clothes that hold no memory, fabrics that are meant to dissolve into the expanse of existence, leaving traces of themselves in the factory workers they poison, sustained in the dying desert, woven into the wombs of anadromous fish, stuck to the stomach linings of flightless birds in order to repair a thing the foundation still needs to be solid and we are dealing with more cracks than credence. It is every waking day under racial capitalism, and here we are, we few two-headed seamstresses, lining the cracks of our hands with prayer, pulling needles and yarn through a worn planet, absorbing the wounds of the past and inheriting the damages of the future, and the whole thing is coming apart. We are all walking in the afterlives of our fabrics. My grandmother repaired and repaired and repaired, never resting, her closet still filled with all of the uninheritance I cannot fit. We are tired of stitching together distarded textiles in the hopes of prolonging the wear and tear on the earth's soul. Could a new world be planted? I watch what is left decomposed into fertilizer and loose threads. But even deserts bloom every few years. So I sharpen my needles, ready to sew my allegiance to its bulbs before it is buried. What a powerful way to start the day, Ashia. Thank you so much for grounding us in the importance of weaving in ancestral repair. Ashia Johnny's a poet with Youth Speaks, an organization that uplifts the voices of youth through spoken word, education, and youth development programs. Ashia is an environmental justice educator a storyteller, black butterfly, cultural preservationist. They recently came out with their first full link book of poetry entitled Heirloom. You can learn more about it in our program. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland known as Yelamu, homeland of the Ramatish Ohlone relatives who are the original inhabitants of Yelamu, AKA the Ohlone Bay. As indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ohlone peoples have never ceded lost nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place as well as the peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors and relatives of the Ohlone communities and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. NCG this year will be committing 1% of all membership revenue towards the three land taxes within our geography, including the Segorte land tax, the Wiat Honor Tax, and the Association of Ramatush Ohlone Unicum Land Tax. Applause. 
We invite you to also pay your institutional land tax and are happy to be a resource as you take an important step toward being in right relationship with Indigenous communities. Thank you for being here, for being present, for bringing your full selves to this incredibly rich day. I'm Dwayne Marsh, President and CEO of Northern California Grantmakers, user of he and him pronouns. For those who don't know me, in brief, I'm a product of my time. I was born in the late 1960s, segregated, grew up in segregated Virginia in the 1970s, and I experienced inequities firsthand. My family legacy associated me with civil rights activists modeling the transformation of systems. I'm in the fifth chapter of a 30-year love story with racial equity and systems change, working in nonprofit, public, and philanthropic spheres. That commitment to equity gives my life journey, fills it with purpose. But I have a life an amazing partner, incredible family, love of music, science, nature. I may have spent way too much time on YouTube during the pandemic. I think I possibly got an associate's degree in astrophysics. <laughs> we are NCG. 40 years of serving philanthropy, from a lunch bunch of trustees seeking services to more than 4,000 individual members, 210 institutional members and counting, a truly representative swath of Northern California. Moving beyond service and transformation, it's not enough to equip foundations to do better, we have to involve the performance of this sector, blowing out the ceiling, raising the floor of what's expected of us. Equity is our North Star. As we'll see all day, we don't achieve the communities we deserve without it. I'll be brief because you have so much coming your way today. Welcome home. It's been too long. Today we reunite the remarkable diversity of this sector. Yet at least one thing binds us, commitment to our communities, acknowledging that among the many privileges we hold, Perhaps the greatest is that we work in livelihoods that will have the chance to improve people's lives. Not many people can say that. For those who have been to an annual conference before, you know that sense of responsibility, of purpose, is part of the culture of this event. For those who are new, we welcome your contribution. These are risky times. We see gains lost, attacks increase on the most basic rights to be a resident, to shelter, to bodily autonomy, to be yourself beyond the unrealistic content of a gender binary. I would posit, though, that the biggest risk we face in philanthropy right now is the risk of not acting, of not taking the bold step or experimenting or confronting the practices that previously may have been good enough, but now they're not equal to the moment. The risk of becoming irrelevant as a sector when we're needed most. I don't think that will happen. Together, we can answer the critical questions. Can we demonstrate that this time is more than just a moment of great transition within the sector, but instead of great transformation? Can we evolve past good intention to meaningful action? Can we effectively shift power, resource, and decision making into community ownership? Can we play the role needed of philanthropy to build the equitable systems this region deserves? This is a struggle that we embrace because we recognize there is no shortcut to racial and economic justice. It's not a sprint or a marathon. It's a marathon full of sprints. We know we have a role to play, and in this moment, it's not enough to do good. We need to do our best and our most. And I suspect that's what draws you into this space. That's why we're here, to map the pathway to a collective future, building on the progress to date, committing to the road moving forward. So take full advantage today of this room, of the wisdom and intelligence and experience and determination and courage in the space, of your longest tenured ally and of someone you've never met before. Be inspired and take on this challenge. Commit to put into practice something you learned today that might seem difficult, elusive, or even fantastic to accomplish in your position or your institution. Make this moment, mark it, and find something here that will change the way you do business and be meaningful and provide benefit to the community you serve. Some of you have been at this for decades. So others have yet to celebrate the first anniversary. We're all welcome in this broad, diverse tent, and we're excited to meet you where you are. But make no mistake, this is a journey with a destination, and that destination is communities with equitable outcomes for all residents, communities worth the struggle. I don't know about you, but 33 months in, I'm just getting started. So let's work together, together for good. We, we, we need to thank our sponsors, all NCG members as well, who without whom this event would not be possible. Our presenting sponsor, Gilead Sciences, our platinum sponsor, James B. McClatchy Foundation. Our gold sponsors, James Irvine Foundation, Marin Community Foundation, Kaiser Permanente. And our bronze sponsors, 
California Healthcare Foundation, East Bay Community Foundation, and the Maine Stanley Smith Charitable Trust. And can we please take a moment and acknowledge the NCG team? I'd ask those of my colleagues who are in the room to please stand. Along with Girl Friday Productions, they made all of this not just possible, but outstanding. They're truly the best team in the business. Coincidentally, a friendly reminder that we have a no solicitation policy at this event, and we ask that all business solicitation occur outside of today's conference. And now I'm extremely excited to introduce our opening plenary keynote, leaning into the possibility of a just, joyous future with Mia Birdsong at the helm. Mia is a pathfinder, futurist, and storyteller, founder and executive director of the Next River, an institute for practicing the future. Her work's always been focused on the possibilities that exist beyond the conventional, engaging the wisdom and experiences of everyday people to expand how we define community, family, and success. In How We Show Up, her book about how we make community and family, she illuminates multiple pathways towards collective well-being. In her work on guaranteed income at the Senior Fellow at the Economic Security Project, she engages the voices and visions of low-income folks to reimagine the American social contract. She's also the co-founder of Family Story. In other roles, Family Independence Initiative, New America, the Aspen Institute, and TED, to name a few, she works on expanding our collective imagination. This session is about planning for the long haul, building the world we want to live far into the future. After her talk, Mia will be in conversation with Crystal Haling, Executive Director of Libra Foundation, and together they'll explore philanthropy's role in building a more joyful and just future. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mia Birdsong. <laughs> I want to begin, oh, there I am, <laughs> by asking you all to imagine something with me. I want you to picture a child that you love. This could be a child to whom you're related, but it doesn't have to be. And I want you to imagine them playing. I want you to imagine them laughing, maybe telling a poop joke. And I want you to see them looking directly at you. And I want you to hold their gaze and just feel how much you love them. I want you to imagine them growing up and having children in their lives whom they love. And I want you to imagine those children growing up and having children in their lives whom they love. And I want you to imagine this cycle for five generations into the future, connected to you by this long, strong lineage of love. It's 21, 23, and these descendants of ours are 10 years old. And these children are thriving. And they are loved and they are cared for. They feel safe and seen. They are free. And you know why? Because of all the work that all of the activists and organizers and artists and educators and healers in this room and in so many other rooms have done to realize freedom. Now, I don't mean the so-called freedom that comes from resource hoarding and domination. I mean real, nourishing, abundant freedom. So what would this child tell you about their life? What does their world look like? If that is a little hard to imagine, you're not alone. Over the last few years, I've invited so many people, people who have committed themselves to social justice, to imagine a liberated future. And more often than not, they struggle to do it. They struggle because they focus their time and energy and attention on resisting and defending and fighting back against the relentless attacks on our communities. And they haven't had the space 
time, or even the permission to imagine the joyful, liberated future that their actions are meant to make way for. And I want us to take time to do that now and for the rest of the day. Take a breath. And let me tell you what I've learned about how we get free. So I've been on this five-year mission, thinking about, researching, and experimenting with freedom in my personal, professional, and political lives. And I'm gonna tell you three things that I've learned. One, freedom is collective. Interdependence and connection are fundamental to freedom, just as they are fundamental to being human. Two, freedom is a practice. It's a thing we do, not a place we arrive. Freedom is a skill we must develop and a muscle we must strengthen. Three, freedom is here for us right now. There is no way to predict what a free world looks like 100 years from now, but we can know what freedom feels like today. And the relationship between those two is everything. We have to be free in order to get free. We have to be free in order to get free. Freedom is collective, freedom is a practice, and freedom is here for us right now. So I'm gonna take those one at a time. Freedom is collective. When I was researching my book, How We Show Up, I came across facts and ideas about freedom that challenged me to be more rigorous and discerning in my thinking. And what I realized made me realize that true freedom has always been a collective endeavor. Historically, human cultures have understood that to be free is to be in connected, caring community. And one of the principal ways to make people unfree is to separate them from their people. Hello, America. Even the origin of the word freedom shares its root with the word friendship. Friendship and freedom are rooted in a Sanskrit word that means beloved. Isn't that beautiful? And learning this resonated with me deeply. It spoke to a truth that I knew. It's the same freedom that Harriet Tubman showed us when she escaped north, where she could have stayed, but instead she returned to the south to free others. It's what Audre Lorde wanted us to understand when she said, without community, there is no liberation. It's what Fannie Lou Hamer told us when she said, nobody's free until, one more time, nobody's free until, yes. It reflects something deeply inherent about being human. We are interdependent. At a cellular level, we crave belonging. And just as we cannot survive without food or shelter or water, we cannot survive without each other. And that version of freedom, a freedom based on solidarity and care and relationship, stands in such stark contrast to the narrative of American freedom, which says, I am free when I am independent and I don't rely on other people. American freedom says, I am free when I have hoarded enough wealth to get everything I need through transactions because I don't trust that anyone is going to help or care for me. American freedom says, I do whatever I want with no accountability or responsibility to anyone. American freedom says, everyone has a gun, no one wears a mask, and you have to do everything yourself. It's anemic and paranoid and disconnected. It is a self-destructive lie that has us striving for a standard that not only is impossible, but it robs us of our humanity. So, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> now now y'all got me going, I'm gonna start swearing a lot. Um, 
let's take a minute to dream about collective freedom. What would America be like if we believed in and pursued collective freedom? How would our economy work? What would our healthcare system be like? What about our food systems? What would it be like to raise children? How would we even think about family? How would we respond to harm? How would we be in relationship with land and other living things? America, as a nation state, has a lot of work to do to realize collective freedom. But at the scale of family and kinship, many of us have already been building collective freedom. And I had my most profound experience of it in 2021. One morning in July of that year, I had a phone call with my friend Aisha about a project we were working on. And I was feeling anxious because I had to tell her something disappointing. I was gonna have to delay my next steps on our project because I needed to have surgery. 20 minutes before our call, I'd been told I had colon cancer. And the beginning of our conversation went something like this. Hey girl, I have some bad news. I'm gonna have to delay the next steps on this project because I found out I have cancer and I have to have surgery. I know we were really ready to move forward, but, and then Aisha interrupted me. <laughs> and she had us take a breath together. She recognized that she and I both needed a minute to absorb what I was saying, not about the delayed project, but about the fact that I had cancer. And in that breath, I began to shift from the shock and disequilibrium of my brand new terrible news to release and grounding. I wasn't less scared but I felt less alone. Before Aisha and I got off the phone that morning, she had the meal train set up to feed my household while I recovered from surgery. Then she circled up with three other friends of mine and created Mia's Care Squad. This group of black women, one of whom is in this room, Mariah, where are you? All right, girl, I love you. These, this group of black women tasked themselves with coordinating the support and communication that I would need to have happen after my surgery and ultimately for the next three months while I underwent aggressive chemotherapy for stage three colon cancer. Now, I have been cancer free for a year and a half now. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I shit like eight times a day because that's what happens when they remove part of your lower colon. I mean, like everywhere too, in restaurants, airplanes, park porta potties. Now y'all are gonna be like, see me in the bathroom and be like, mm hmm, you're pooping, aren't you? I'm gonna be like, uh huh, that's what I do. If you invite me into your house, I'm gonna shit your bathroom. Um, but other than the anxiety that I experience when I encounter one ply toilet paper, <laughs> my crisis has passed. I went through hell, but it was also one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. And I hope that every one of you gets to be loved and cared for that deeply. So I benefited from this collective care. But as I've heard from so many of the people who took part in supporting me, so did they. Participating in such an intentional effort made them feel part of something hopeful and generative. And in the midst of a pandemic that showed us how thoroughly abandoned we are by existing institutions and structures, my community, like so many others, created a kind of micro-infrastructure that gave us a model for what's possible. And this project of shepherding me through illness was an intuitive experiment in world building. And like world building, freedom itself is a practice.
Number two, freedom is a practice. So because of COVID and my compromised immune system, my husband Nino had to handle all of my at-home care. But everything that could be done by someone else was done by someone else, from providing food to finding healthcare practitioners to making sure I exercised. My people were committed to my health. Like people were showing up at my house in the morning to make me go for a walk. <laughs> and throughout my illness, my spirit was considered as much as my body. My delight and pleasure were tended to as much as my physical health. There were spreadsheets for people to recommend TV shows and movies and books. There, were, there was a joy fund that my people created for me that I was to use exclusively for things that brought me joy. When I was having surgery, there was a circle of loved ones on the hospital lawn singing for me. I got regular deliveries of plants and flowers and books, body butter, crystals, and candles. I got regular texts of affirmation and joy and funny memes. Prayers were lifted for months. I was awash in love. I was saturated with kindness. This practice was for me, but it wasn't about me. My illness was a spark that my, that my community gathered around to be part of something vibrant and alive, even as, or maybe because, it asked us to contend with our mortality. If we practice freedom together, if we notice how we and others are already practicing freedom, we will make more present a future where our interdependence is seen as a celebrated central design assumption. Getting me cancer free was an intention, but it was not where we found purpose. That was in the generous, loving celebration of life that we created and experienced together. We were exercising a muscle that showed us how to be present and rooted, not only in a practice with each other, but a practice around crisis and tragedy. Practicing freedom invites us into a deeper way of being free in an unfree world. Number three, freedom is available to us right now. In the course of the research I've been doing for the project I'm working on, Freedom's Revival, I've asked dozens of people when they feel most free. No one says, when I get my paycheck, or when the next Amazon package arrives at my door. <laughs> people tell me things like, when me and my friends are laughing so hard we can't breathe, or when I'm sitting on the beach and my feet are in the sand and the waves are washing over them. Or, and this one came up a lot, when I'm on the dance floor. When people describe these experiences of freedom to me, they describe how connected and present they feel in their bodies, in their hearts, in their spirits. This feeling of freedom, and I know you've all had it too, this feeling of freedom is a compass. It tells us which way liberation is. It leads us towards safety and generosity. It leads us toward grief and release, just like the breath I shared with Aisha. It doesn't mean we aren't scared or we don't suffer, but we don't do it alone. We know that we aren't gonna have justice and liberation until we end the systems of oppression that are pushing us toward annihilation but the end of oppression is not freedom. The end of oppression is not freedom. Freedom is a way of being. And we have to understand that our practice of collective freedom is a remembering. It's about returning to ourselves and about looking at what comes next. We are living through 
a relentless, rupturing state of crisis. Rising fascism, a climate on fire, misinformation and threats to civic participation, disconnection, exploitation, all driven by systems honed over centuries to oppress, extract, erase, and divide. And a decades-long multi-pronged strategy carried forth on the far right. From policy to culture to media and informa information to the very structures of democracy, they have been unwavering in their commitment to their agenda. Those of us committed to justice and progress, we have ceded too much of the power of visionary world building because we are so focused on resisting and clarifying what we don't want. Do not get me wrong, we need to fight back. But if that's all we do, we are building a world in which we fight back. And if we can't imagine what's possible beyond the boundaries of what we don't want, then the landscape we dream up is landlocked by those who don't want us to dream at all. For example, among my favorite activists and artists and thinkers is the frequently quoted reminder that in an unfree world, joy is an act of resistance. In that world, where joy is an act of resistance, we are righteous defenders of all the things that we should all have. But we can't stop there, because joy is a birthright, not a rebellion. I want a world in which we're not rebelling against anything, where joy is joy. So now I want you to think back again to that child, our descendants, who you're connected to through a hundred year long love line. Think about those children again. If we want those children to grow up in a world where they are thriving and loved and cared for and so free, then we have to time travel. We have to practice the future. Practicing the future means standing with one foot in the realities of the present and one foot in an ever-changing imagined future. And I'm continually trying to walk a single path with my feet in those two places. Sometimes the space between the future and the past, or the future and the present, is thin and transparent and that walk feels easy. Other times it's like one foot is traversing icy cliffs and the other is trying to find footing on top of the ocean. That space in between full of tension and contradiction and paradox. But it is in that slippery place where my footing is uncertain, where I find illumination and wisdom. That's why I find this work about freedom so enlivening. It has sparked questions in me about what life could be like, about what's possible if we stand in the long arc. There is no version of this walk to freedom that could fit in the parameters of a three-year grant cycle or a five-year strategic plan. <laughs> but listening to Harriet and Fannie Lou and Audrey has brought me into alignment with what has always been generational work. Freedom in its most connected, embodied form is our inheritance. It is a gift from our ancestors, and we know this deep in our bones. And it is the gift we must give to our descendants. It is your sacred birthright and your joyful duty. And my invitation to you is to join me in helping all of us remember what freedom really is. Thank you.
Now, thank you. It is my absolute pleasure to invite onto the stage with me someone who I have so much deep admiration for, who I watch very carefully. I'm like, what's she gonna do next? What's she talking about? Someone who I think of as a friend. Crystal Haling is the executive director of the Libra Foundation and has brought a fresh, fresh and so clean, clean <laughs> vision of philanthropy that rejects business as usual and is responsive to the needs of frontline communities. Since 2017, Crystal has worked with the Libra Foundation board, Nick and Susan Pritzker and their four adult kids to advance these goals, including doubling Libra's grant making in 2020 and launching, launching the Democracy Frontlines Fund. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Crystal Halen. <laughs> Mia, that was stunning. Thank you, Bella. Thank you so much. And I, I can't think of a more important time for us to be having this conversation. Um, I actually want to start out with a question for you about the daily practice that you use. Because I know something mm. about you that many people may not know, which is that you are a deep gardener and you're a beekeeper. Yes. Um, which is utterly terrifying to me, but um, <laughs> I think that there is a connection between putting your hands in the dirt, being a tender of the soil, and coming to a different understanding of this birthright of freedom that you're talking about. So I'm wondering if you could just spend a little time because you, you talked about this as being a remembrance, mm -hmm. about being a heritage. And so many of us come from people who farmed, who put their hands in the soil. Talk a little bit about that connection and that legacy. Oh, wow, would. yes. Um, I think of the earth. So many. All right, I have like nine things to say about this. We didn't practice this question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm terrible at that. I no, that. I love it. <laughs> so one of the things I, um, during the pandemic, kind of was, was, was uh, told by nature <laughs> is that gravity is the earth reminding us that we belong here. Hmm. And especially during, I mean, there was a pandemic, there was the, you know, George Floyd's murder and the uprisings, and then there was my experience of having cancer, right? And all of that uncertainty, turmoil, questioning, um, the reminder that I belong here yeah. was deeply comforting. The other thing I did during the pandemic is start a coven, as one does. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Mariah is also in my coven. Um, and we, it was through some work we were doing with um, Norma Wong, if you all know her, you know she's amazing. If you don't, you need to look her up. And we were asked to do this work on behalf of um, a particular land and a particular people. And we chose the Bay Area and we chose um, redwoods and eucalyptus as our people. So we began to have this relationship with these trees, and um, one of the things that you, that trees will tell you if you get into relationship with them is that tree time is not human time. <laughs> and trees be in the world in a way that is absolutely in a long arc. Right. And that is accepting of uncertainty, mm -hmm. right? And um, that practice for me, I feel like whenever I feel like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, or do people really need to hear what I have to say, or am I gonna die, or whatever it is, right? Are my kids gonna be okay? Is humanity ending, right? I remind myself that I'm not spinning off into space because I belong here, and that 
that long arc is, puts me in alignment with work that my ancestors have done to got, get me here and that all I, all I need to focus on, all I need to do is what I'm meant to do here and what I need to pass on to whoever comes next. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have, we're having a conversation in philanthropy right now um, about relationships mm. and about trust. Mm. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, you know, there is this sense that we need to develop our own freedom, but you really did talk about this as being a community process. Yes. And yet for many of us right now, our organizations are feeling a lot of stress. Yeah. Our communities are feeling really fractured. And yet we're being called to trust, to be in community, to be in relationship. Maybe if you wouldn't just share a little bit about what that trust meant, because you talked about your community caring for you. Um, I'm not sure all of us would be able to accept that. I remember there being this decision point for me after my diagnosis um, where I was like, I'm telling everybody. I was like, do I, do I do be stoic, right? Mm -hmm. Do I be a strong black woman about this or not? And I was like, fuck being a strong black woman. I'm gonna be a soft black woman. I'm gonna be a vulnerable black woman. I'm gonna be a human, right? Like I'm gonna be a whole person. And I was like, I'm gonna tell everybody and I'm going to make it clear that I need help. That there's no way that you know me and my husband can do this by ourselves. And part of what Part of why I was able to do that is because when I was researching and writing my book, I saw in, you know, from the people who I talked to, their experiences of asking for help and offering help were like, brought them so much nourishment and delight, right? That, that being able to show up for the people who they loved did something for them. And you know, it's not like, I wasn't like, I'm gonna do this with my husband and like one other person. I was like, I'm gonna ask everybody because then the collective efforts, right, will not be, nobody has to show up too much, right? They don't have to go beyond their capacity. Um, but the collective effort I knew would be enough. And I trusted that people would show up the way that they could, right? That no one was going to feel like burdened by um, having to do anything for me because they also knew this was a whole community effort. It wasn't being put on one person's shoulders. Um, and there was the organizing that happened. There was my care squad, but there were these other groups of people who also self-organized to make sure that whatever it was that I needed, no one person was holding that. Right. Um, and that, I feel like that experience of understanding what's possible when the collective puts its mind to something, right? When the collective shows up to do what they need to do, um, remind, like told me, I was like, okay, this, is, this was the way we need to do it. This is how we do it. We don't do the shit by ourselves. Right, right, we're not, we're not in this alone. Um, so often though, here in philanthropy, we think that we're expected to have an answer. We're expected to know the strategy. We're expected to know how this grant is going to result in this outcome for this community. And I know that, that spending time in philanthropy isn't all that you do, but I'm curious if you could share a little bit about what your dream for us would be as philanthropists to admit we don't have the answers, open up to curiosity, um, be in some community. What would be, you've applied for grants. You know yes. us from yes. uh, the experience. What are your dreams for philanthropy for us enacting some of these practices? So there, there are two things. One is for each of us to hold our own kind of divine humanity and again understand that we as individuals are not 
deciding everything for everybody. It's not on our shoulders, right? There is a, there is a kind of, and this is not just in philanthropy, I think for many of us there is this kind of, um, we think it's all, all on our shoulders and it's a kind of like narcissistic, <laughs> individualistic way of thinking about things. That It's all gonna fall apart if we don't do it, right? No, I mean, maybe it will, but like probably not. Um, and if we ask other people to help us, then it definitely is not gonna fall apart. Or if it falls apart, it will fall apart with ease. Or it's meant to fall apart. So I think there's a piece there about like, uh, like being whole humans in this process. Mm -hmm. I think, hold on, I'm gonna cough. Getting <coughs> over a cold, I've taken like nine COVID tests. <laughs> um, I think the other piece is more strategic, and that is how, in my experience, how I see philanthropy defining success or results um, is too specific and short-term. The, the work that we have ahead of us, if we are standing in a long arc, we're not gonna know if it works for a while. The project I'm doing right now, y'all, is, uh, we, I keep calling it a 100-year project. So when I they fill out grants, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I have never, I've never done this before, and I'm gonna be dead um, <laughs> before it actually happens. So I can't tell you that it's going to work. But when we think that a solution to something has to happen in a year or three years or five years or even 10 years, then we're ignoring the solutions that take a longer time. And those longer term solutions are often the root of something. They're the things that will actually change the thing. And when we don't get those solutions an opportunity to at least, for us to at least try it, and for many of us to try it, then we end up with these kind of band-aids. We end up with these short term things. We end up with these, with these uh, limited dreams about what we think we can do. Mm -hmm. So I want us to be thinking more long term, and I have to give a shout out um, to a model in philanthropy. So the Walter and Elise Haas Foundation recently released, I don't remember what it's called, mm -hmm. but um, it is an investment Endeavor? in a handful of organizations, and they're getting funding for seven years. $500,000 a year for seven years. Like, not alone like $15,000 grant for seven years, because don't nobody need that. Like a, real, like a real amount of money for seven years. And that kind of, of long-term thinking, right, allows people to experiment, allows them to do things through failure. Like we need to fail a lot more at the things that we're trying to do because we need to be trying to do things that are a lot harder than what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. I have one more question for you. All right, and then I have a question for you. Okay. Um, if this is work that is generational, um, how are we to take knowledge and wisdom from our ancestors to bring forward? You mentioned a couple of incredible ancestors, Harry Tubman. Um, how are we to do that when we're living in a world where history is the enemy? Mm. <laughs> Say that. I mean, I think we have to remember that it's not actually the enemy, right? I'm gonna get a little spiritual on y'all. So for me, one of the things I think about when, when I think about like doing this work that is not going to happen and you know that won't end until I'm dead, I think about uh, black folks who were alive in I don't know here in the 1740, let's say, and I think about how for generations before them, all they knew was American slavery and that they never saw emancipation. And how I'm sure some of them 
when they thought about this institution that built this country, right? Our entire economy was based on this, right? Slavery, too big to fail. How they, um, some of them I'm sure were like, we just need to make slavery less shitty, <laughs> right? Like, just make it like nicer slavery. Fewer beatings, a day off, you know, whatever. And then there were other folks who were like, this will not stand. They were like, this system needs to be abolished. And I think about the, how you had to be standing in an ancestral line in order to believe that sometime in the future, some descendant of yours would be free. And if we hadn't had those people, I would not be here on the stage today. Mm -hmm. We need to be those people for our descendants. That's why I invited us to think about our descendants 100 years in the future. Because I wanna think about who, what is the world I want them to look at, live in, and what am I doing right now to make that possible? Beautiful, thank you. All right, my question for you. Okay. <laughs> so, we agree on a lot of things, and you wrote this, I think, pivotal and inspiring piece in the Stanford Social Innovation Review recently about what philanthropy needs to do, how it needs to change, the shifts it, need to make, it needs to make in our social environment, political changes we're facing, all of that. So given what I said, and given what you understand and your beliefs, I'm wondering what you, as a philanthropic leader, and if you're in philanthropy and you're not following Crystal, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> but what do you think philanthropy should be funding right now? And how should they think about funding? Well, I think one of the things that's very exciting for me about being here today is um, I honestly think that this community is helping to lead the way. Um, some of the practices that folks in Northern California are doing in philanthropy are really trying to shift how we do our work in this field. And what does that mean? It means that we're actually coming together in collaboratives and pooled funds in a way that is about our edification, about our getting better at this work together, and not just about what are they, our grantees, doing. I think we're also building deeper connections and relationships. I've been so schooled and educated by some of the indigenous funders that I've worked with, whether it's Seventh Generation Fund or others, that are really trying to say, let's not just talk about relationships, let's talk about our relations. Let's think of ourselves as being interconnected with one another. And there are some of those speakers and some of those leaders here today that we're gonna get a chance to do um, to, to be with and the blanket exercises here, that we get to actually experience what that means. And we've done some of that with the Democracy Frontlines Fund. We've traveled to Montgomery together. I know the NCG board went to Montgomery. I know we took Democracy Frontlines Fund, our funders together, because part of why we came together after the um, death and the murder of George Floyd Part of why we came together is that we said, if we were surprised by what happened, then we didn't understand what the world really looked like. And so we were willing to take our glasses off that were narrow and open the aperture, right? That we were willing to be curious about what we didn't know and learn together. So I think some of those practices are the things that we're doing where we're saying, how do we understand this linkage that you just talked about? the history of slavery and enslavement in this country to the current modern day carceral state and understand that there is a lineage there, but there is also this lineage of freedom. And how do we bring those together and weave those together in philanthropy? And that is, I think, where we are beginning in, in this community, taking big strides forward to ask ourselves, how can we practice this freedom? And how can we practice this learning together about it? That's what I think we have to do more of. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I want to ask a question that you, um, I think, have begun to spark in us. 
One of the things that we are struggling with in this field is the issue of diversity and diversity of thought. Um, we have begun to develop the ability to listen to and be in relationship with people who look different than we do, who think differently than we do, who behave differently. And yet we find ourselves often still heeding these barriers of what we're willing to accept. So people initially thought marriage equality, that's a little bit beyond where I'm willing mm -hmm. to go. People may be thinking to themselves right now, anti-trans legislation, is my foundation gonna jump up and down about that? Mm, maybe I can't quite get there. Talk to me a little bit about what it means to open our hearts to people different from us and why that is part of this practice of freedom. So I think that um, one of my growing edges over the last five years has been specifically, um, has been sparked by, sparked by folks who are doing disability justice work and trans justice work. Mm -hmm. And part of what I feel like I learned from the folks in those communities who are doing that work is what solidarity really means. So there is an approach that I, there are two things. One is understanding that, um, you know, if they come for you at night, they're coming for me in the morning. Right. And being able to see the erasure, the lack of inclusion, the attacks on disabled folks and trans folks as understanding that, that that's on us, right? That we, are ex we, we will experience those things. Um, <coughs> I think too, um, so there's a, there's a, you know, there was this great piece that um, Angela Blackwell Glover wrote several years ago called Curb Cuts, and um, the Curb Cuts piece, that's what I refer to it as, and it's about how the work that disability justice folks did to um, put curb cuts, which are the like ramp things on a sidewalk, in, ended up benefiting other people, right? People with strollers, people in wheelchairs, people with walkers, people with very short legs, <laughs> um, so there's this understanding that we get from that, that, that sometimes things that are done for, to, for the benefit of people who are not us will ultimately benefit us. The other thing though, is, so that's like a direct benefit. Interdependence asks us to understand that I'm not free unless you're free, which means that even if, if something for someone who's more marginalized than me, if something benefits them, but it inconveniences me, it is still to my benefit, right? Because it indirectly benefits me because it helps you be well. It helps you live a full life. It helps you be free. So when I think about why I feel deep, imperfect, but deep solidarity with disabled people, with trans folks, it is because I understand that those folks are going to be hit by any kinds of injustices and oppressions that are eventually going to impact me, number one. But two, I need people in my community to be well, because then I can be well. The example I often use for folks is thinking about abortion. So I'm 50. And Roe v. Wade was uh, passed in the year I was born in 1973. And I feel like my whole life, there has been this, like, we have to protect Roe, and on the one hand, and this kind of celebration about the, the fact that we have access to abortion. But if we really look at how America has, has treated Roe, right, many, many people did not actually have access to abortion. There are, ton and those people were poor people, people of color, people who live in rural areas, did not actually have access to abortion even though abortion was legal. 
we also ended up in these whole conversations where we're fighting and spending like millions of dollars about like 15 versus 20 weeks or eight versus 12 weeks, as opposed to being like, people do not actually have access to abortion. And if we look beyond abortion and think about what choice actually is about, it's not just about do I want to, right, the choice for me to like keep or, or end a pregnancy, it's also about the choice I have to be able to give birth in the way that I want to, the choice I have to raise my child in an environment that is good for them. So this idea that the, that the thing is about abortion, right, is a very individualistic, for people who, who felt like they had access to abortion and they were safe if, if, as long as Roe stood, right? That's a very individualistic idea of choice. If you think about freedom of choice as meaning that black women who are wealthy should not have a greater maternal death rate than poor white women, that everyone should actually have access to healthcare, whatever that healthcare is, that when a trans person a trans man goes into the gynecologist to get care that they're not looked at funny, right, or disparaged in some way or denied service. If we think about what it means for all of us to be able to have childcare or raise our children in, in, in safe and healthy environments, that's what we're talking about. And when folks don't have access to that, that means they are not free. So the fact that people with privilege had access to abortion is irrelevant because if we're talking about collective freedom, it's a much broader thing. And, I, and where I saw that being practiced was in reproductive justice organizations run by black, indigenous, and women of color, mm -hmm. right? Those folks were talking about um, access to childcare, access to um, healthcare. They were inclusive of trans and, non, and trans and gender nonconforming people in their work. Mm -hmm. That's what collective freedom looks like. Mm -hmm. Defending Roe is not it. Yes, I think I don't know much. I don't know what this timer means over here. Is that <laughs> real timer, y'all? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Just want to make sure I knew actually how much time we had. All right, hold on. Let me find it. <laughs> so. When you think about the work that you do mm -hmm. and what it is that you are trying to accomplish in your lifetime, what are you dreaming of? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, this is a really, um, this is a great question to ask now. Some of you know that I just came back from a two month sabbatical. And um, I went on my sabbatical broken, <coughs> deeply, deeply broken hearted. Mm. Um, I think that I had lost faith that this work that we do in philanthropy um, was gonna make a difference. I didn't see the path from where we are now to where I hoped we would get to be, to the world that I hope my kids and my grandkids and live in. And um, during the sabbatical, I did a couple of things. I did a lot less than I normally do. In fact, I focused on being and not doing um, as my basic practice every day. I spent a lot of time outside. Nature has something to say. The earth is exhausted and we're exhausted. And the earth has something to say about that. So when we go out and spend time in the green um, on a daily basis as part of our practice, I think it really helps to renew us. Um, and during that time, I also spent a lot of time with friends and community. And just as you described through your experience, um, I was reminded of the fact that when I feel like this work is on my shoulders, 
um, I'm giving up on us. Mm -hmm. And I can't give up on us because we have done so many incredible things collectively. I think about my father as a civil rights activist and what he was passing on to me and asking me to take care of. And I think about my kids and where they are now in their lives. I have two teenage sons. Um, and they're carrying the torch forward too in ways that I don't even think about and that I don't even yet know about. So I think for me, the work that I'm hoping that we can do is to be much more in the collective of us. It's much more in the dreaming about what it means to create a floor below which we will allow no one to fall. That we are not in this work because we want to make poverty less painful, but because we actually want to eliminate poverty that we know that there are enough resources. This is a rich country. We're a rich and beautiful and proud and powerful people. We can do so much more than the things that we say that we're gonna do just in our mission statements and our strategies. And yet, when I talk to people in this field, what I hear is people who are itching to do more than the confines of their organizations currently allow. And that itchiness and that friction and that tension is often what we're afraid of, but it's what we've got to lean into. We've got to acknowledge as executive directors that we don't have all the answers. We have to acknowledge that the young people who are demanding things that make us <laughs> nervous, <laughs> We've got to be, we got to lean into listening. Yes. And I'm saying this to myself, yes. just as I'm saying it to you. We've got to <coughs> lean into the listening and we've got to lean into the curiosity and we've got to open up to maybe there's a different way of doing this that isn't about being exhausted, that isn't about taking it to the absolute max and that may also sometimes be about slowing down, not speeding up. Yes. So those are some of the things that yes. I'm learning that I'm hoping that we can build into collectively because it's very counterintuitive to the way I entered this work. And yet I'm learning so much from the slowing down, from the spending time outside, from listening to people who are younger than me and, who, and, and building into this notion of us of what we can do together, because that's what gives me a lot of hope. I love that so much. Thank you. So I think we have time for a few more questions. And I think, were we gonna take questions from the audience? I don't know, sure. Can we do that? <laughs> do y'all have like any questions? I feel like we've been talking for a long time. And you know, the thing about it is there's just enough light in here for me to see you. So if somebody doesn't raise their hand, you know I'm gonna call on you. We've totally abandoned whatever they had planned. Just exactly. By the way. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask somebody to be curious and brave. I have a come yes. on. Come on. What's it? your question? My name is Sandy, and I'm with the Director of the Dolphin Wellness Foundation. Hi, Sandy. I love what you shared. Thank you. And my Oh my God, that's such a sweet question. Um, so this is what it looked like for me. This is always what it looks like for me to write, and this is what it looked like for me to write my book. I would spend like an hour and a half like setting up the space and like making tea <laughs> and you know, putting some laundry in the washing machine. And then I'd like write for 20 minutes and then I'd get distracted and like go outside and like stare, literally I stare at bugs or you know, feed my chickens or whatever. Um, for me, part of what I realized writing is and finding words is, is that it is mostly in the being. It is mostly in conversations with other people. Um, it is not writing. <laughs> now, 
They're the people who like, you know, they get up at 6 a.m. and do calisthenics and sit for four hours and write and then they have cucumber sandwiches and <laughs> then they edit or whatever. This is, that's not me. My writing is like 30% of the time is writing. <coughs> the rest of the time is doing other shit. <laughs> Which I feel like is probably unsatisfying, but it's so true. <coughs> That's so great. Another question. I also want to build on that, Sandy, too, just to say one quick thing. I've noticed and I feel like a lot more of us are writing. Don't you think that's true? A lot more of us are writing? Um, and whether that's because we want to talk to each other, that's great. But I also find that I'm being lit up by fiction these days. And, um, you know, so many more of us are reading and talking about books and things that we are, you know, and we're sort of coming out of the closet about the fact that we are excited about fictional characters, that we love science fiction, that we're, you know, that there are, are ways in which we are opening up our own creativity. Um, and that that is also a part of the practice of philanthropy. Right? We actually have to be more open to our own creative process. And I know you are a writer, Sandy, so I'm looking for that book too. So, but those are pieces that I think really are very important to this. And book. I think this makes me think that like so much of like part of why I started an organization like a dummy um, <laughs> is that part of what I saw coming out of the 2016 election is the, the way in which the right has galvanized people around a story of what's possible. Because we all know what Make America Great Again looks like. It's a shitty story, but we know what that looks like. And our work is much harder because we have to engage in speculative fiction making, mm -hmm. right? None of us has lived experience of the world that we are trying to create. We have ancestral me memory of it, and we have abundant imagination. And I find that in the speculative fiction place is, is part of where I get to expand my ideas about what's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanna double down on the, and also I read a lot of like trashy romance too, because um, <laughs> that's fun. But I'm just saying in terms of like our, this invitation to world building and what what allows our minds to expand. Um, we have a much harder job, um, partly because that side is also authoritarian and we're not, we're never gonna like all agree on everything. But there's this beautiful process we get to engage in, in, in the world building that we do that requires our creativity and imagination. I also wanna just throw one other thought there. Um, I recently was able to uh, visit an organization in um, South, East New Mexico called um, uh, Somos Un Pueblo Unidos. And um, this was a, it's a, it's a community organizing group of primarily uh, monolingual Latinas who have been organizing the heck out of their community. They've unseated, uh, you know, uh, a certain number of uh, four or five state legislators who were not serving their community. They have passed legislation for universal child care. They've just yes. done all this Look. incredible work. And one of the people who was part of the organization, who's a staff member now, was a young man who shared his story, who came to the United States when he was five years old. And now this community, by the way, is um, a largely immigrant community that came to work in the oil and gas extractive industries. So these are folks from mixed status families who have very little political power to speak of, but yet they are organizing themselves and they love this community that they have built and they are fighting for their community. So they have passed legislation along with other groups throughout the state, but they passed legislation to allow people who don't have documentation to get driver's licenses. And this young man who came to this country when he was five found out that this organization that his mom had been a part of had passed this legislation when he turned 16 
and was eligible to actually get his driver's license. So his mom and all these women that he knew had actually had the forethought to build the path that they knew this young man was going to need to be on. Mm. Then when he turned 18, he found out that they had worked on getting legislation passed that would allow him, as a person who did not have resources, to actually get in-state um, uh, um, tuition at the universities in state and get um, be eligible for scholarships and financial aid. So he found this out when he was 18 so that he was then able to go to college. And he's now working in this organization, supporting and doing the work to continue to build the path for the next generation of kids. And what it really reminded me of is that people are looking for homes and community. And so much of the time we think what we are doing in philanthropy is providing services to people when in fact what people want are the resources to build the community that they want. By the way, these women were talking to us about the fact that they are demanding of the state legislature of New Mexico, that they've read the reports, the environmental reports that say that there's probably about 10 more years of oil left in the ground, and that they want to demand of their legislators that they actually begin to put renewable energy as the plan for New Mexico going forward. So these are communities that are already building the world that they want to see. And these are not folks that we think of as being the strategy planners, the policy makers. They are. They are using their imagination, their creativity, and their desire for their kids. They're building those. So to some extent, the question about what I want to see is I want to see myself as being the person who's sitting next to in relationship mm. with the people in communities who are building the future we want to see. So that's what I think can be the real future we have here love that. in philanthropy. So, and I think that that's it. That's it. You Our time it. is over. Thank, Thank you, you guys so much. Hey, y'all, it's so, so good to see you all. It's been since 2019, since we've been together, and it's just a beauty. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Kate Seeley, she, her pronouns. I'm the Senior Director of Leadership, Culture, and Community at NCG. I just want to invite us all to take a deep breath and internalize some of what dreaming looks like that we got so much of from those two. We're gonna head into breakout sessions and it's gonna be really content rich and I want us to keep that long arc in mind. And remember that each, with each breath or with, with each seat on the beach or with each community member that you're, that you're engaged with, that these practices and these relationships can help us remember how to dream and how to be open to what's possible and to make that happen in our organizations and our work. So to get us there, I'm going to turn the mic to my fabulous colleague here, Samaya Constantino, who's going to give you all the information that you need to know about how to get to your breakouts. And we're going to do that now. Thank right. you for being here. Thank you. All right. So I'm Samaya. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I work in marketing and content creation here at NCG. If you look at the screen behind me, you'll see um, the location of this morning's Envision sessions. We do have an update, though, for the Indigenous History Activity Pathway in the afternoon. That's been moved to the lobby if you go outside of this theater to the left. Um, and then to help you find your way, you will see a map inside of your um, pamphlet pro slash program that you all should have to help you get to your breakouts. Um, we are so grateful to be in a unionized gallery, which means that room capacity has already been set for us, and we cannot move or add any chairs, so just to be mindful of that. 
Um, and then I want to take a moment to thank the interpreters from Deaf Services Unlimited for doing ASL today. Um, and then if it's helpful for you to have ASL in your breakouts, please go to registration and they will help you with that over there. Um, and yeah, the Envision sessions start now, so make your way over, check out your maps. There will be ushers along the way to help you get there. Um, yeah, we hope you leave today feeling inspired. Thank you, everybody. Have fun. <laughs> Have fun.